All right, we are again on the break it track for ShmooCon 2008. The next talk that we have is 21st Century Shell Code for Solaris by Tim Vetus. Thanks. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, everybody for waking up early and attending the uh, noon talk. I uh, appreciate you dra dragging yourselves out of bed and coming down here to the break it talk. Uh, so like it says, 21st Century Shell Code for Solaris. Uh, it hasn't really been revisited for a few years, so I thought we'd take another look at it. Uh, I kind of pulled out of a pet project where I was supposed to go do something, and then I uh, kind of did it in a way that wasn't supposed to be able to be done. So I decided to talk about it. All right, so who am I? Uh, what really matters is you probably don't really care. You're already in the room, so you got here. The description was good enough to get you here. Uh, I have 50 slides. We have 50 minutes. You do the math. We don't have time to, to dick around with who people are and who knows who and that kind of stuff. So normally I like inline questions, uh, but again, 50 slides, 50 minutes. If you have a question that's more for you, kind of hold it off. I'll be around the rest of the weekend. You can find me. I've got red hair. Pretty easy to find. I'm a tall guy. Um, if you have a question that's more for an everybody in the room, go ahead and uh, raise your hand or throw something at me. I can't really see very well with the, the light, so uh, just take out one of the smooth balls, throw it at me, and uh, we can see if we can answer it right there. All right. So what are we going to do? Here's the, the obligatory what we're doing slide. We have shellcode background. Uh, how many people uh, know of shellcode, the word shellcode? All right. How many people have programmed an assembly at some point in their lives? How many people have written actual shellcode? How many have written shellcode and submitted it to some project like Metasploit and it's actually being used somewhere? Okay, so, uh, okay, good. So I get a demographic where we go. Maybe we can go through some of these uh, preliminary slides a little bit faster. Uh, so we'll, we'll do a little bit of some uh, do-it-yourself, how you can do uh, shellcode, how you can play at home, uh, look at some Solarisisms, and then finally, we'll get to the, the newer, smaller uh, shellcode payloads, uh, look at the thought process, and uh, do some demos. All right, so I'm going to write up for this uh, slide deck. A few assumptions, uh, Intel 32-bit architecture. We're using our Intel syntax on the slides. If you're an AT&T guy, you have to do the transposition and the adding of characters in your head. And uh, yeah. Nope, no Spark, x86. Uh, so, all the code you need to play with is going to be found throughout the presentation. So, uh, when you go to the website after the con and you download it, you should be able to do the cut and paste thing out of Acrobat and get it to all work. Uh, no zips or going to weird websites to find files and stuff like that. All right, so what is it? Uh, most of you guys have seen it. Historically, it's something that gives you a shell, like bin SH. Uh, but anymore, it's practically just very low level architecture dependent stuff that does some action now. So uh, we have all these different actions that uh, like Metasploit has built into it now. So shellcode's not new. If you think shellcode's new, you really need to think about LSD. All right. Back in 2001, last stage of Delirium put out a, a pretty comprehensive guide to uh, Unix-style shellcode. It's the Unix assembly code development for vulnerabilities uh, illustration purposes. Uh, just Google it. I don't think they actually maintain an actual site anymore. But uh, I need to point this or something. <coughs> Hate all this AV stuff. How about that? Is that better? Uh, so anyway, I don't know if they still maintain a site, but uh, if you do the, the Google research and you search for that string, you'll find the paper somewhere hosted. All right. So why you must not depend solely on Metasploit? So maybe you need to do something custom, right? Metasploit has all these built-in payloads, and that's fine and dandy, but maybe they don't have the exact one that you need. All right, detection avoidance. We have IDSs. We have antivirus. We have firewalls. Almost all of those are still signature-based. So if we have a payload that fits a pretty specific signature and everybody's using Metasploit, then you're going to get caught just like everybody else is going to get caught. So if you can write your own code, you can write variants that accomplish the same tasks but get past the signatures. All right, practice, right? Everybody needs to know what this stuff is doing at the low level. This goes hand in hand with the last bullet. Uh, do you really know what that Metasploit binary blob does? 
right? Everybody can click the buttons and get MSF payload to generate some stuff, but do you really know what's going on uh, behind the scenes? And then the middle two slides, the discovering new methods and the creating the smaller payloads, that's kind of the crux of what we're going to get into when we get into the Solaris stuff later on in the slide deck. All right, Shellcode 101, how to play at home. So you need four basic things. You need tools. You need your editors and your assembler. If you're really just concerned with the binary blob, those are the only two you need. Right, you need to make your uh, assembly, and then you need to assemble it into the binary blob so you can run your shellcode. Now, depending on how you're doing your testing, you might need a linker if you want to, uh, say, make a, an ELF file that you can actually execute instead of having a crutch program that will jump to your shellcode, or you have uh, a handy old exploit that you can use it on. And then uh, similarly, you only need a compiler if you're compiling test programs or if you want to make code that links against libc or something like that. Uh, so I assume that all of you guys are, are good enough to like find your own tools and whatever you prefer. But these last three bullets we'll go into a little bit. You need to know your architecture. You need to know the actual OS you're writing for. And more than likely, unless you're superhuman assembly binary reading ninja, you're going to need to do a lot of testing to figure out that everything works. All right. So Shellcode 101, architecture. So for the Intel architecture, this means knowing all your special purpose registers, EAX, EBX, ECX, and, and so on and so forth. You need to know the different addressing modes of these registers. So EAX is a 32-bit register. AX is the lower half of that. AL is the lower half of that. And uh, the different ways that you can get to the data that you need to be uh, modifying. Indianness, so we're talking 32-bit, little Indian. Uh, and then you need to know how the specific instructions that you're concerned with in your shellcode are actually going to work. So you don't need to download the, the five-volume Intel architecture manual and memorize everything, but the instructions that uh, pertain to the shellcode that you're writing, you need to have intimate knowledge of those because you need to know what registers they're affecting and how, right? What are, what are the semantics of what that uh, instruction is going to do on the CPU? All right, for the OS, you need to know how the OS works at a pretty low level. Right? You don't need to know where the start button is. You need to know which bytes go in which registers to invoke certain action out of the OS. So since you're basically asking the OS to do actions on your behalf, uh, you need to know how to ask what. So different OSs document the formula for asking these questions, and some do it better than others. So we're talking about a calling convention. Basically, this boils down to a stack versus a register calling convention. Uh, but there's different hybrids and there's different uh, kind of weird oddities that you have to keep in mind, something like Linux sockets. So here's a huge generalization. We're going to take our system call that we want to perform. We're going to put it in the EAX register. And then you have to pass the arguments to your function. Uh, think of it like a function. So uh, you have to pass your arguments to the system call. These are either going to go in other registers other than EAX or you're going to push them all on the runtime stack. And then something like the Linux sockets where you end up at the hybrid, where the Linux uses a register call method, but uh, the socket information is pushed on the stack. Uh, there's only so many registers, right? So you can't push everything, or can't uh, put everything in a register. And somehow you have to actually, uh, you finish formulating your question, you actually have to ask the OS to perform the action that you want. And this is going to be done in three ways, with a software interrupt, uh, a sysenter or sysexit combination, or what's known as a far call. And then, kind of by convention, it's just understood that at the end, the return value from your syscall is going to end up in EAX. But there's also some oddities you have to remember with that. All right, and the third piece that you need, or the, the fourth piece, the third one that we're talking about, is the test platform. Ideally, this code is somewhat OS dependent, so all the shell code that we're writing is very dependent on our architecture and our, uh, our OS. But uh, the test platform can be pretty generic because we'll just compile it on whatever target we have. Uh, since the shell code that we're generating is usually what you're going to run immediately after an exploit, our test uh, platform is basically going to be the world's most vulnerable code. All right? And by this, I'm not talking about some uh, hugely popular mainstream OS that somebody would call the world's most vulnerable code. Uh, we're talking about an application that basically all it does is uh, a jump to the code that you want to run. Uh, and then for network testing, basically we want to accept an incoming connection and then immediately transfer control. So there's many variations of this on the web. Uh, a lot of them just deal with local shellcode testing. They don't lend themselves to uh, socket-based testing. Uh, but here are the ones that I'm using. Uh, that actually shows up bigger than I thought it would. Um, so just uh, really briefly, we uh, just create a big buffer. 